Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber. And today our special guest is Dr. Mark Kukazella, and he'll be speaking at our conference in February. Mark is also one of our triple threat presenters as he's passionate about fitness, nutrition, and science. He's been a big supporter of our conference over the years. So how's it going today, Mark? Oh, it's going well. It's 70 degrees here in West Virginia. I think this is like the last, you know, warm fall week and then winter will probably hit. I, I hear you guys got snow already out there, uh, or at least up in the mountains. Up in the mountains. Yeah, it was beautiful here for Halloween last night. <laughs> yeah, maybe be a good, it's been a couple poor ski seasons with <laughs> whether it's just uh, global warming and such, but maybe, maybe this year you guys will get some good, some good skiing in. Well, we always keep our fingers crossed. So a little more, a little bit more about Mark. Uh, Mark's a retired Air Force Reserve Lieutenant Colonel, a family doctor who actively sees patients and also is a professor at West Virginia University School of Medicine. Mark conducts medical education courses on health, fitness, and running and developed the U.S. Air Force Efficient Running Program. Mark has been an advocate for low-carb nutritional science and has published several papers as well as lobbying to update nutritional guidelines. Mark has received several distinguished awards for his contributions to teaching, fitness, and community. Mark is truly an exceptional educator. So Mark, if you can provide some more background and tell us about your personal and professional interests. Well, thank you for the kind words. You know, I'm just part of the tribe, Jeff, and I think I, I came to your first conference in Breckenridge, uh, I don't know, that what year, maybe 2017, 16, it goes way back. And I, I think it was just so cool to see, you know, a lot of people all over the globe doing similar things, you know, people that are doing a little bit of science and everyone's got a, a little higher weight in their own area. You know, I'm probably more clinical and, you know, dabble in a little bit of the science because it's so fascinating. And then there's the real scientists in the room, you know, who are doing the bench research, you know, people like, you know, David Ludwig types, you know, published hundreds of papers, you know, I've published maybe half a dozen on, on this topic. But I, I just see that the power, um, I live in West Virginia, Jeff, which is the most obese and diabetic state in the country. I mean, we're probably one and two with Mississippi, depending on which which a random poll you read. So there's you know a huge need. And um, gosh, for over 10 years, we've been doing uh, diabetes remission in my community. And it's been a very much community driven. You know, my institution allows me to do this, but it certainly hasn't been embraced as a standard of care, you know, in around my state. But there's pockets now, you know, based on some of the work we're doing here. Uh, and it, so it's spreading, you know, we can make type 2 diabetes go away. I'm a little how I got into this. You know, I think all of us have some kind of backwards way in based on our own story. So you mentioned the efficient running program. So, so my uh, personal background is I've been a competitive runner and athlete for many years going back into to college days and in the Air Force I was traveling around a lot running races and doing a lot of sports med and um, there's a fitness test in the Air Force and it involves running so imagine if you went into your hospital Jeff and you had to pass a mile and a half run test you know if you just walked in how many people would not pass that test and then you have to go home right you, you lose your job so in about 2012, they had changed the standards of this fitness test. It was a, a bicycle test or a step test. It had various uh, uh, different uh, parameters, but then a new chief of staff came in and said, we're going to make this easy for everybody. You know, we're going to make it a run test. And um, if you fail the run test, you fail and, and uh, you get some remediation. But if you don't pass, you, you know, you're, you're discharged. And that's a pretty big deal if that's you and your career. And the failure rates went up to about like close to about 25%, which is profound, right? That's like going into your hospital and the next day, a quarter of your work staff, you know, might not be able to continue their career. So they gave me six months to work on this project. And I, I noticed immediately just by digging in, I've, I'd never been a data person because you never have time. You, you know, you read some opinion papers, people need to run more, or exercise more. That's the only way to get fit. I mean, that's what I kind of believed. But then I looked at data and it was pretty clear that obesity was driving fitness test failures. And I think now, 10 years later, probably not too surprising. I didn't understand the metabolic component to that. I just figured, well, gosh, yeah, if you're carrying an extra 40 pounds, it's, it's harder to run. And I kind of went down the rabbit hole of nutrition. And, uh, you know, the internet was, was kind of new there. And you could actually Google search in 2012. And, you know, you're just randomly searching stuff. And this article 
came up from Gary Taubes, you know, in the New York Times. Maybe it's all been a big fat lie, you know, and it's just, I read that and I was like, well, that's fascinating <laughs> because, you know, in my career, maybe we're, we're about the same age. I think, Jeff, I graduated residency in 95. When, when did you finish residency? I'm afraid to to tell you it was um, um, 80, uh, uh, 82. Oh, wow. Yeah, 86. So you're giving away, giving Actually, away your yeah. secret sauce. 86, there. 86 is, yeah. Yeah, so you, you look young, you look well, Jeff. So, you know, I just turned 56. But yeah, so this was like really different than everything I had learned. But he had also, that, that article um, was kind of following a book that he had published called Good Calories, Bad Calories, probably one of the earlier books you had read, Jeff, back in the, I think that was published in 2007 maybe so it was like a 450 page tome you know with like a thousand references so i read that book like twice and you know you start scratching your head you're like gosh maybe he's right right <laughs> maybe gary Tobbs is right and i i spent um six months and a good part of that time was traveling to multiple military bases around the world and uh you'd be in a base gym Jeff, and imagine like all the people who needed remediation is sitting in a, sitting in the base gym and they don't want to be there. Right? They're the ones who failed the fitness test. And here, like the running doctor is going to come talk to them and like yell at them and tell them to run more. That's what they were thinking. But we started it off like this. Is that, has anyone in the room lost 50 pounds and kept it off for a year? You know, it just kind of make light, it just start a different conversation. And there's always be like one hand, maybe a couple. It would go up and it'd say, you know, Sergeant Smith, what, what, what did you do? And across the board, no matter where you were in the world and who that person was, it was some variant of the same. They'd say, well, I got rid of all the bread, right? Or I did paleo, which in those days, there wasn't paleo junk food. It was like, you know, eat meat and cheese and some vegetables, you know, or like a gutsy one would actually, they knew I was a doctor and they're afraid maybe, you know, I would throw them out of the room. They'd say like, well, I did this thing called Atkins, you know, and they were like a, a but I was like, yeah, you know, and then, and then someone else say the same thing. I got rid of soda. So, okay. That's like, we call it um, observational evidence, right? So you see something that's real and then you got to explain it. So that was enough for me to say, okay, maybe, because there wasn't a lot of randomized trials then. Uh, Eric Westman's work hadn't been published yet. Uh, Finney and Vilek's work hasn't, had, but so that, you know, based on scientific principles, history and observational evidence, I, I knew there must be something to this. Um, and kind of just serendipitously, you know, kind of roads collide at the same time. You know, I got to go get my physical every year in, in the military to maintain standards and be deployable. So my A1C was up in the pre-diabetes range. It was like 6'3 range. And, and I, you know, I look like this. I just actually won the Air Force Marathon. So I'm like this skinny running doc. And, um, but, at, you know, at that time, it was really weird. I was waking up at two in the morning, every morning needing to eat more and more. I was like eating just crazy, crazy amounts. And um, so they sent me over to the endocrine clinic and um, they did a, what's called a C-peptide, which is a, a marker for those listening who may not know labs. That's a marker of your own insulin production. We call it endogenous. So this is the insulin that my pancreas is producing. So that's an extremely low number. And then they put on uh, like a CGM, which was kind of new at the time. You couldn't see it on your phone. None of us had phones. It was just like a box you wore for three days and they would track your sugar and then download that data. And my data was like all over the place. I'd spike up to like 250, but then I would crash because I was really insulin sensitive, had a little bit of a second phase insulin response, but like no first phase insulin response. So sugar, that would explain my 2 a.m. awakenings because I was always like hungry, right? Like at 10 at night, I'm hungry. I'd eat more cereal, you know, and be crashing to like glucose of 50 <laughs> at two in the morning, wake up. You know, it, and that was like, I was the guy, Jeff, that would be, you know, the drug reps would always bring bagels to the hospital, right? So I would be the guy, even though I didn't like the drug reps, but I was always hungry. So I would always be like hoarding a bagel or two just to stick in my um, pouch. So like within a week after, because I, at that time, what was fortunate, Jeff, was I'd read all the Taub stuff. So I wasn't afraid. If I hadn't come across Gary Taubes and good calories, bad calories, I probably would have said, well, the solution's not to eat sugar, but if I eat fat, it's going to cause me a heart attack. My dad had a heart attack and bypass at age 35. So I felt eminently confident to flip the food pyramid upside down. And that changed my life. I, yeah. All of a sudden, it's like, I feel good. I'm not hungry all the time. You know, I, I have energy again. It was like, it was personally, that just was epiphanal in just how I felt. 
Well, let me started uh, applying this to patients, and that's you know, the story goes on from there. But you know, I want to hear I hear about patients. I I just have to back up a little bit. Um, actually, I I graduated from uh, uh, residency in '86, and I, I, I'm sorry, medical school in '86, and then re residency was '90. So I'm a few years ahead of you. Yeah, a couple years off, but, but yeah, same gen. Yeah, but my interest began in around the year 2000, Y2K, about 10 years before Gary Tobbs hit 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 the mm -hmm. road, and uh, you know, it was Dr. Atkins that I was influenced. Uh, by and and then when Gary Tobbs came along, I said, "Well, who's this guy? He's just recreating what Dr. Axens was talking about, but but in a very good way." And then Nina Teicholtz followed as well, and so um, yeah, just just excellent. And um, you know, I had some some of my own metabolic health issues uh, back at the time, and and I had learned from my patients as well. And uh, it's just interesting your story as as an ultra endurance athlete. Um, it sounds similar to the story of uh, Tim Noakes in, um, in in South Africa, where uh, he also discovered that he was a pre-diabetic. And I, I imagine you were um, performing at, at, at peak levels and pounding down carbs. Oh, yeah. I was a pure, you know, pure glucose burner, but I could burn glucose like the best of them, you know, so but you're constantly chasing it, you know. I think at that time it hadn't negatively impacted my running performance. I was doing more shorter events, not super long ultra marathons where you really have to be fat adapted. Um, and I thought that was just the way it was, right? There was no other alternative, right? You carbo load, you eat a lot of carbs during the event, right? A lot of goos and gels and Gatorades and sports drinks and replenish your carbs and, you know, wake up, rinse, repeat. But um, when I made the switch for my own personal health, I didn't certainly didn't make that switch out of thinking, it was going to make me run better. I knew nothing about the running side of low carbohydrate. Most of that hadn't even been talked about, but it, you know, I could wake up in the morning and I felt great without, I used to always have to eat before I ran, but I could wake up in the morning and go run for like two hours and, and feel great. And they actually feel better, you know, like in the second hour with, you know, taking some fluids and maybe some salt, you know, if it's, if it's hot, but that, you know, that, that was just really kind of liberating that you don't need to be constantly chugging sugar and uh phil maffetone was a big influence on on my my world at the time so he's he's like the shaman of endurance sports and he was talking about fat adaptation in like 1980s with the world-class triathletes of the day so i went back and, and he's a good friend and we've spoken and taught together but went back and read a lot of phil's work and it's like oh my gosh yeah you slow down too by slowing down your pace being a conversational pace, you teach your body to use fat as fuel and your speed gets quicker at that conversational pace. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. This is probably like a six month process before you really got your body tuned to being able to run without calories to be able to make that energy yourself. So if you're listening yeah. to this and think it's a, it's a one day, turn the food pyramid upside down, go for a two hour run without carbohydrates, <laughs> you're, you're kidding yourself. But I mean, I, I hope that you and I both have a long, you know, a long life of physical activity, you know, whether it's skiing, walking, running, cycling, or whatever it is you like to do, you know, that's being able to do that with your own stored energy is, is the most anti-inflammatory path. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm sure that, and as you've told your story, your metabolic health improved, but you were already a, a, an elite athlete before you had uh, switched over to a to uh, using predominantly fuel, but I do recall that um, you had shared um, shared with others that uh, your VO2 max and your aer aerobic threshold, and it's a bit technical, maybe you can get into that, went through the roof when you switched to, uh, to fat as a primary fuel. Yeah, so it's not the max. So there's a couple of things to make this easy to for people to understand. So the VO2 max is kind of the maximum output your engine can do. And when you're running or cycling at your VO2 max, you're pretty much 100% glucose burning, right? You're just lighting matches. That's that top end gear. You know, you might have gear one, two, three, four, five. That's where you've kind of gone through the gears and you're at gear five until you fall off the back of the treadmill. So that max value is a marker of your fitness. But what's most important is what percent of that max can you exercise at while you're still burning fat. So it's kind of like you've got a Prius car, you know, you've got this little gas tank and an electric battery. 
and that electric battery is highly efficient um, and can go for, you know, go for a long, long, long time. So if you can be at like 90% of your VO2 max, still electric, meaning burning fat, you don't bonk. And I think any, everyone's probably heard that term, right? And in a marathon, you're going to somehow hit the wall like you run out of glycogen. But if your body can oxidize fat at rapid rates, you can be running at very high speeds close to your maximum effort and still be burning fat. And that's a, a, a very good place to be because then you don't need to eat calories, right? You're, you're good. Like a lot of people doing these uh, triathlons, running events, they say, well, my stomach goes because they're trying to, well, I need 400 calories an hour because I'm running this pace because they can't burn fat for fuel. But when you're running, it's very hard to digest 400 calories an hour. Imagine, you know, pounding, you know, four gels an hour, you know, over several hours and ultimately your stomach just shuts down. So the less you have to rely on that and the more you can use your own fat for fuel, that's a good place to be. And, and my that that level on on in my own numbers, you know, going and getting these tests went from I used to switch over at about 50 percent of my max to burning carbs, like switch into the gas tank. But after, you know, several, maybe four or five years of low carb and, and slowing down, you know, it's the right type of training. I could be running at about 90% of my VO2 max, still burning fat and oxidizing fat at about 1.8 to 2 grams uh, per minute. And uh, before they started studying low carbohydrate athletes, the highest they were recording in runners and cyclists was about one gram uh, of fat a minute because they were more reliant on carbs. So there's this whole other world of people doing low carb that hadn't been studied yet. Um, and Finney and Volek have, have studied that group in a study called the FASTER trial, where a group, and this isn't a, these people have been on low carb ways of eating for about 18 months. So, so it wasn't uh, like someone like three weeks. You'll see things in the literature, Jeff. Well, if you switch your diet in three weeks, you actually do worse. And I was like, well, that's probably true because it takes more than three weeks to really change the way your body accesses fuel. So I hope that make some basic sense, but your goal is to up your fat oxidation and that's human health and performance. So, yeah, I believe that you're basically described aerobic threshold and, and your numbers were very remarkable because they hadn't studied uh, fat adapted um, athletes. And, and the point is that the, the way the measurement works is you really need oxygen to uh, metabolize fat. And uh, you, you can, in an aerobic way, uh, aerobic way, and, and yes. aerobically, it, you can process carbohydrate. So, look, obviously, there's a role for carbohydrate in in diet and lifestyle. Yeah, but, absolutely. But but the Even point in, is in the that as 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 time goes on, uh, being an athlete dependent on carbohydrates isn't necessarily a healthy thing. Yeah, I think you have to look at who you know if you or I are seeing a patient you know, who is the patient? You know, if you're a 20-year-old world-class Kenyan runner, you are you can light matches, you can burn carbs. They don't have metabolic syndrome. They don't have an inflammatory response to their carbohydrates. They don't have atherosclerosis. You know, eat carbs, run fast <laughs> until they probably get to a certain age. Um, but actually, when you look at that group though, you know, they can burn carbs super fast, super efficient, but they're also actually, their zone two, training shows that they're actually very good fat burners too. So they call it fat max. So at what speed are you burning the most fat for you as an individual? So even these people that are eating mostly predominantly carbohydrate, they're so fit just by their training, they can burn a lot of fat. And I think that's something that gets missed in the low carb world is, is that no, these, these people eating, eating carbs are actually like really fit. They, they don't burn fat as efficiently as a low carb athlete, but they're burning way more fat than a diabetic patient who is actually on a low carb diet because they're so metabolically broken. These people need a very slow rehab out because they get off the couch and they, their bodies just, their mitochondria don't work well. They produce lactate at the most minimal level of exertion. And when lactate's up, you can't use fat for fuel. That's why most of our diabetes patients, they go get the mail they're, they don't feel good. They can't, they're in an energy crisis. And that's where, you know, clinicians listening to this, they need our help because we need those people to slow down, right? If they go to the gym and they're told to do high intensity, they can't do that. 
like they're broken. They need to kind of start in gear one and maybe in six months when they've actually built those mitochondria again, you know, in the correct way, you know, got their glucose down, then they can start to ramp up the exercise intensity. It's very individualized. Um, the role for carbohydrates. So if you're mostly a low carb uh, person, very well fat adapted while you're exercising. So say you're listening to this and you want to go do like really like people are doing these ultra marathons now, like a 50 mile race. They may be out there eight to 10 to 12 hours, you know, and you do need, you want to stabilize your blood glucose. When you're exercising, your body disposes of the glucose without insulin and it does not shut down your fat burning. So if you're taking in, you know, 100, 150 calories of some form of glucose and electrolyte, while you're exercising, once you've made the adaptation to burning fat, that's money in the bank because that's good, right? You're, you're not raising insulin because the insulin shuts off fat burning. But while you're exercising, your body, they're called GLUT4 pathways for the geeky people in the room. But yeah, so these GLUT4 pathways come to the surface of the cell and allow the glucose to come in without insulin. So you're not spiking insulin, you know, by taking a little hit of, you know, some type of sports drink. You know, we're not talking about drinking 32 ounces, but it's kind of the drip method. You know, you just keep a little glucose going because your brain, if your brain gets hypoglycemic, it tells you stop because your brain is like captain of the ship. So if any of you all have exercised and you get a little hypoglycemia or like you feel like you just want to stop, you haven't bonked. you got plenty of energy. Just give yourself a little hit of glucose. Don't be, you know, some low carbers are afraid to touch any carbohydrates. No, no, your, your body's disposing of that. I'm not telling you to do that while you're not exercising, but while you're exercising, your body has like a backdoor disposal system of that little bit of glucose to just help you that day. If your goal is, you know, to have performance that day. Yeah. So uh, basically you're saying exercise is a great way to shunt energy into muscle. Yes. Through, yes. Through, they, yeah. Through glut four pathways and others. It's, it escalates like 10 to 50 people have even said a hundred times that your muscles are the biggest sink of blood glucose and exercise is basically, it's like a vacuum of glucose. So we, we did a study with these CGMs, Jeff, put them on new diabetes patients, didn't give them a lot of coaching, had them just log you know, log their foods a little bit, learn from it, CGM, continuous glucose monitor, um, their new diabetes patients. And we also wanted them to see the effect of exercise, right? Go for a walk, you know, see what happens. And across the board, going for a walk was like, you know, taking a little short acting insulin. And it was cool. So they learned that, like they, oh, wow, like I go, my sugar's 180, I go for a walk, you know, 30 minutes, not five minutes, like a nice stroll, like not even hard, right? Just go walk the dog 30 minutes and the glucose. And I think that's something as clinicians, we really should be reinforcing with patients because exercise is probably the biggest lever for, I know you, you and uh, I've heard talk about the levers, right? So for longevity, quality of life, exercise, like you just get off the couch and your 10 year all cause mortality goes down like 50%. It's crazy. Nothing else we do has that much impact. Combine it with better eating and, you know, it's kind of the, the you know, it's duplicative, but, but the exercise is like super powerful. So, yes, yeah, and you, we encourage people to do anything and everything that they really enjoy, movement, activity, exercise, cardio and resistance. And you kind of live on the uh, endurance side of it. And at our conference next year, we're going to have a, a bunch of uh, speakers that are actually on the resistance side of it. And so- Oh, it's it's all good. Behind uh, me, I have a set of kettlebells and resistance bands. <laughs> I'm getting old. So like, I love to run for my brain, but I come back and, you know, I'm lifting my kettlebells. So I think, you, yeah, you know, either they, they're, they're not either or. I think you need to do, you know, you and I, are, we're becoming old guys, right? We have to do strength training to keep right. our muscle mass. So I think it's fair to say and we all have our addictions and I've- Yeah, like, we're addicted to the endurance. Addicted to the endurance part of it, but I'm also glad to hear that you do the resistance. Oh, and, you, you have to, it's non-negotiable or else you get sarcopenia, you know, and like the protein and the resistance is for, to keep the muscles and the endurance is for happiness for, at least for me, that's, you know, for my mood. It, that's absolutely. I mean, any, any, kind of, any type of exercise is good. Uh, but I have to ask the endurance guru. And again, you're 
to me, you're a model specimen for someone that can endure. And the question is, are there potential long-term uh, risks to uh, prolonged endurance? Yeah, that's always been a big debate. So the, if you look at, they're called, uh, you know, the curves, right? So, so some people call it this inverse U curve. So we know that that first 30 minutes a day, you know, your mortality, all-cause mortality drops, you know, significantly. And then you get out to like an hour and a half a day and things tend to flatten. Now you'll see a couple small studies showing that if you're really hammering your body several hours a day, like world-class triathlete level training, there might be a little uptick and that's mostly right heart strain and atrial fibrillation. But in my clinic, I've yet to meet a patient exercising eight hours a day. So maybe if you're a coach of these people that are just doing, and that's not healthy exercise, they're trying to win prize money. But for you and I and anyone working in a clinic, it's like that, that it's all good. Like the fitter you are, the longer you live, right? So there's not consistency in this inverse U where there's going to be this uh, detrimental effect of too much exercise. Most of the literature actually does not support that. You know, that the more you do, the, the better off you are. But again, that's, you know, it's, it's uh, when, if you don't get agreement in the data, then you, you have to say, well, maybe it's not absolutely true. Right, so there's complete agreement that getting off the couch is very good for you. Running eight hours a day, maybe not. And I, I don't encourage anyone to do that. But um, that middle of the road exercise and early exercise, you know, getting off the couch, probably the biggest lever anyone can do for their health. Sure. Well, you know, I, I've had my fair share of orthopedic injuries from, from all my sports uh, over my lifetime. And uh, of late, I've cut back on running and I'm doing some more resistance training. The other interesting finding is that uh, they see higher calcium scores in endurance athletes. And the question is, is, is that nature or nurture? And, you know, maybe it's got to do with, with diet, who knows, but that's just an interesting observation. Yeah. And this, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it was a different talk I actually pulled up some really interesting stuff on that, Jeff. And one is like, you could even Google autopsy Clarence DeMar. So Clarence DeMar was born in the, in 1880 something, and he won like seven Boston marathons. And uh, Paul Dudley White of Eisenhower fame, he was Eisenhower's cardiologist, probably told him to not eat cholesterol. But um, when they actually did his autopsy, he had significant calcium, as do uh, several endurance athletes. They have, but the calcium density is higher, but the diameter of the blood vessels, like Clarence DeMar, the diameter of his blood vessels were like twice, like his pipes are huge and he's got some, cal some dense calcification. So when you look at event rates, runners have less cardiac event rates than people that don't. But I think again, it becomes the individual patient. I do a lot of calcium scores. If I see a runner who has a high calcium score, I wanna know what their lipids are you know, I want to know if they have metabolic syndrome. Like, do they have something that's going to contribute to instability of that plaque? You know, and, uh, you know, aspirin, possibly if they've got a, you know, a high genetic predisposition for apel B or LP little a, you know, that's the role of medical therapy, you know, in these, in these folks, you know, because they do have a high plaque burden and we don't really have good science to know which exact plaques are unstable or stable. There's actually an article, it's called The Myth of the Vulnerable Plaque. If anyone wants to pull that one up, it's a fascinating article because the cardiologists tend to always be able to tell their patients, this is a vulnerable plaque we're going to put a stint in. You know, maybe it makes them feel good, the patient good and it's good for business, but we have no clue really what the vulnerable plaque is. I mean, do you have any insight, Jeff, on like when you see all these calcium scores, just by seeing thousands of them, do you have any insight into which you know, distributions might be more vulnerable. So, and it, yeah, it's, a, it's evolving, Mark. And yeah. Karam Nasir, cardiologist, will be speaking on the latest, greatest yeah, cardiovascular imaging. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. It's and very evolving. Yeah, now they're using, um, you know, AI, AI technology to interpret CT angiograms. So uh, the word's still out. So it's, it's a fascinating uh, uh, area uh, to look at. And uh, 
Yeah, I think what we can do, you you, you did mention, um, you know, your talk is related to zone two, tra zone two training, and, and uh, that seems to be uh, appropriate uh, as we age, as time goes on, and especially you mentioned uh, patients that have weight issues and need to kind of gently go back into things. But that really brings me into the, cl the, the clinical setting of, you know, which we're both uh, doctors still seeing patients. Uh, I'm in, I, we're both uh, family doctors, yeah. right? And, you know, I'm in a family practice and you are in, um, I, I, it's a diabetes center. Mix, I, I do a mix of just general primary care family practice, uh, some diabetes specialty, and I do all the cardiovascular testing. So this, you know, we really get into the weeds of, of you know, digging through the chart. You know, even these lung CT screenings, now you're picking up big plaque burden and the patients have no idea, no one's ever talked to them you know, incidental coronary calcium on their, on all these different studies, you know, most patients walking in for a stress test, because we image everybody now in an ER, they've had CT angiograms for PEs, but they're, I'd say 50% already have known cardiovascular disease by a test already done, and the patient doesn't know it yet, and it's not quantified in most cases either, but you'll, you'll see these comments on these um, yeah. other studies people have, but yeah, it's bringing all this together is what you and I do to try to yeah. help people yeah. well, not die of cardiovascular disease. That's the big risk for the diabetics. Yeah, when, we, when we see scans like incidental findings of coronary calcium, we send them for the, the, the heart calcium score. And mm -hmm. we really want to quanti quanti quantitate, find out if patient has cardiac symptoms. And I do just want to mention there's, you know, Matt Budoff, who's one of the uh, cardiologists that's done a lot of research around uh, uh, heart imaging you know, he 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 coined the term cal, uh, uh, stable calcium. So, like like your your athlete, that yes, has, and the runners, mm -hmm. runners that have um, stable calcium and the pipes are still flowing, and they've never had an event. And so, uh, in a sense, that's that's somewhat reassuring that they haven't had events despite having uh, these higher calcium scores. So uh, in the clinic before the podcast, we were mentioning the use of CGMs, and I, I imagine our approach to uh, addressing uh, health, weight, diabetes, prediabetes in the clinic is similar. Yeah, I've read your book. I mean, it's very similar, you know, figure out which lever, I mean, stress, sleep, you know, they don't move, right? But I, I think nutrition is the biggest lever to immediately fix someone's blood glucose is get rid of glucose in the diet. Um, but I think if they don't address the other things, you know, it has an expiration date. As you see, like if they don't fix their other issues, you know, they'll, they'll rebound. Um, so start them off. Get, and the, the CGMs are great, uh, Jeff, as, as you know, too. Like they see it immediately. Gosh, they go like a week with, you know, green list foods, you know, which are going to be, you know, plants and animals, you know, non-starchy veg, and they see their glucoses be like 250, 300, and without medications even, they're like normal in a week. So they it gives them hope. All right, now let's talk about, you know, the sustainability of what you're doing and what other levers. You need to build some trust with them first. A lot of these people, you know, they're just, they're very skeptical of, of healthcare because every time they come in, a different doctor, right? They're on a new medication. They're getting side effects. They don't understand what tests they're having done. No one's sat down with them and really, you know, given compassion, meaning I'm going to do everything I can to help you. And that's what I try to teach my medical students. I have medical students with me most days. It's like, not only do we understand your situation, we're going to do everything we can to help you. You know, we're going to give you our contact, give you your glucose monitor, follow you, lower your medications actively. Okay, tomorrow we're gonna to communicate, you know, via text or my chart, you know, let's see what your sugars are. Okay, hold that insulin today. It's a very active management, but they appreciate that. Yeah, well, it's unique because, you know, our approach is, uh, we believe providing them with the right tools and it empowers them to make a positive change and, and, you know, sitting down beside them as, 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 as a comrade to say, Hey, look, here's an approach that can, can really give you some uh, great results. And I think for diabetics in particular, the CGM just provides uh, tremendous feedback. And, you know, we now read, read the, uh, get a reading off of their phone or they can download the, the information to us. Uh, to us mm -hmm. and we we can see these fantastic trends and uh basically you can look at a 30 60 90 day trend 
of the average at, a, at any particular yeah, this, time during the day. It's great. It's so cool. So we can see patients. Well, you know, on in the mornings, their their sugars are high. You know, it's it's an enhanced dawn phenomenon. Yeah, you see their daily graph and the trends and yeah. Yeah, for yeah. for a 30, 60, 90 day period, yeah. I, I, that just blows me away. Or then you can see, okay, there's, you know, in general, their sugars come down during the in the afternoon or the evening, and and you know the, then we then we can take some some action based on that. So it's really good feedback, and and everyone's running to me wanting to get a CGM, and, and that's fine. But it, it's interesting, Mark, because there there's another subset of individuals, uh, and in particular, they're they're women, and they're they seem to be metabolically healthy and not at their ideal body weight, and these are the ones that are more insulin sensitive. And I said, well, mm -hmm. look, you can, you know, we don't, we don't see that they have much problem in blood sugar or A1C. And I, I you know, they want, I don't know that the CGM would necessarily. No, I don't think them. it might just verify for them as your lab testing. Well, that, you know, they're not diabetic, you know, they're, you know, they're insulin sensitive, but the same rules might apply that they need to reduce the hyperinsulinemia, which might be the elephant in the room, but you know, women store different than men. And, you know, is it subcutaneous? Is it the wiggly jiggly bits, which isn't going to cause them to die sooner? Or is it, you know, central visceral fat um, that we know is, is, is bad. So yeah, everyone's an individual. And, um, but it, I think patients get, even um, they see their lines are flat. So if they want to, they're curious about it, they use it for two weeks and it's like, okay, we don't get, it's, you don't need to keep doing this. And I don't want people to be so tied into their CGM to make them orthorexic, to be afraid to eat anything. And I think you're seeing some of that now too, where people who don't understand, okay, it's, it's normal to have a little glucose spike after a meal, like that's not going to kill you. And they're afraid to, you know, have anything, you know, even the protein. Um, so I, I think they need good coaching, like you're doing in your clinic about, you know, what that data means for that person and not set them down another path of disordered eating. Exactly, Mark. Thanks for those comments. And uh, we we don't find that a high fat diet necessarily works for these ins insulin sensitive individuals. And no, it's so too, too many calories. I mean, they're going to, and some are fat addicted too. Uh, Joan Ifland will speak on that. But yeah, I mean, the high calorie, high fat foods are also very highly palatable. You know, so I, I see that sometimes too, if they're getting like online coaching and someone, you know, a uh, a skinny low carber will say, well, I can eat all this fat I want, right? But if it's my obese low carber, the same rules don't apply or they'll be on Pinterest looking at what someone's eating and loading it with more and more fat. But some, but you know, that's why we're all end of one experiments. But yeah, be careful of that pathway too. Um, I love eating bacon, and I, but I'm not trying to lose weight. I could eat a pound and probably pound another pound. <laughs> but if I'm trying to lose 50 pounds. It's probably not a good strategy for me to do that every day. Yeah. Well, we're going to be addressing eating disorders at the conference next year. And, you know, uh, we, we don't want to create uh, more confusion or orthorexia and, and people are just uh, too focused in on things. And, you know, at the end of the day, we, we think what's important is uh, to teach people about making the right food choices that control appetite. And at the end of the day, they they feel good uh, about the mm -hmm. food choices, their health. I like to call it mindfulness. And um, on both both sides of the insulin resistant and the insulin sensitive person, the mix of macronutrients might be uh, different or would be dif different for sure. But uh, hopefully, we find the right combination that will can control uh, appetite. So, um, yeah. Um, I guess maybe to get back a little bit to the the, the zone two training, which will be your uh, topic for the conference. Do you have any more thoughts about yeah, that? I can just define that for people. People don't like, what are these zones, you know, of, of training they'll see? Do I need heart rate monitors or, you know, fancy stuff? And you, you really don't. So, so what zone two, so when we exercise, we're kind of like going through a series of gears, you know, so, so gear one or zone one is just like an easy stroll right? You're just out walking on the boardwalk. You're not really stressing any system of your body, but it's good. It's good movement. Zone two is the area. So we have different muscle fiber types. We have these red fibers called slow twitch type one fibers. And these fibers love to burn fat for fuel. They're loaded with mitochondria. 
loaded with capillaries. That's why they're red fibers. And the fast twitch fibers, which can work a little bit on the aerobic side, but also anaerobic, these are more glucose loving fibers, but they're for more intense exercise. So the zone two training is that level of effort where we're maximally taxing those slow twitch fibers. So it's what pace are you recruiting the most of those fibers without tapping into, without getting into to gear three, where you're starting to tap into the fast twitch fibers because you need to go quicker. So if you need to get more power output, you know, the fast twitch fibers, which produce, uh, which use glucose can produce more power quickly than the slow twitch fibers. Fat's a slower fuel to burn, but it can burn a very long time. So that training is you're maximally adapting that muscle fiber type. And what's important about that, you know, even for high performers is when people have trained those slow twitch fibers, you know, maximally, that's when we're burning the most fat uh, as we can as an individual. That allows us to do high intensity better because when we do high intensity, we produce what's called lactate. Now, most people connotate lactate with acidosis and like, I have to stop exercising, right? Most people think, oh, I'm building up lactic acid, which isn't really what happens, but we produce, remember that uh, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA pathway and the cytosol <laughs> and all that, we'll maybe show a slide. So that's, you know, the anaerobic side is the glucose gets broken down into pyruvate and you produce uh, two acetyl-CoAs and, and you get the lactate. Um, now that lactate can have a couple different destinations. If you have this really robust type one fiber system, you know, these slow twitch fibers, that lactate shuttles right back in to those muscle fibers to become aerobic. So we don't become acidotic. So you can work a little higher end if you've got this big engine. So every Tour de France cyclist has a massive zone two base, whether they're a low carber or a high carber, because they've just done tons and tons of riding at conversational pace, right? 80% of their training is they're just going up in the mountains with their team and their buddies riding hours a day, you know, and chatting about whatever they're chatting about. And then, you know, they'll hammer the hills a little bit, but the base of their training is building up this um, big uh, red muscle fiber base. And that's the, that's the foundation of health too, because that's mitochondrial health. It allows you to do more intense exercise and recover quicker, because if you're doing a CrossFit workout, it's not the intensity that gets you, it's being able to recover before the next set. You know, you're gonna go from station to station, you're gonna do a Spartan race, you gotta go climb something, you know, really intense. But if you have a really good type one fiber base, zone two base, you can keep, you can do that again and again and again and recover, but we'll, we'll explain it. But it's, the good news is if you're listening, this is not hard training. This is what you would do on like a, maybe a little higher intensity than a coffee ride, right? You're, you know, you're able to carry on a conversation as soon as your respiratory rate goes up, right? So we make CO2 when we're burning glucose. And the more glucose we're burning, the more CO2 we make, and we have to expel it. So as soon as you're exercising at an effort where you're having a conversation and then now you can't talk anymore, you've, you're into gear three and gear four. So most of us prefer to go exercise when we can talk to somebody or listen to a podcast or something, listen to music and be pretty comfortable. So that's, that's the good news is it doesn't need to be painful. You can do that, mix it up on your bike. Walking, power walking is great. You know, so many of my patients have bad hip and knee arthritis. They can't run, just get them to walk, you know, walk with some sticks, the poles, if they're gonna trail walk, it's really good for arthritis. Swim, if you have access to a pool dance, cross-country ski, you know, whatever it is you can do. Yeah. Oh, great, Mark. Well, I also want to add, you know, you're talking about endurance, but, you know, re resistance training, uh, of course, is an anaerobic uh, process, but but that also develops mitochondria. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, builds mitochondria. It also adds to, you know, shunting the glucose and energy into muscle. And so both zone two and resistance training together, um, it really the point is that it, 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 it is to perhaps enjoy exercise to improve exercise and performance, but but it's 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 a longevity factor and it's a healthful factor. And and so I I, I in one of my talks I I've used the phrase that 
longevity is an endurance sport. And I kind of love- Yeah, I would, I would agree. That. I mean, we're all kind of training for that age 90 so we can get up off the floor maybe. You know, so <laughs> that's where strength training comes in and eating the protein. But yeah, everyone like, you know, my, my room here is set up for resistance training. You know, so that's like the icing on the cake. Like if, if you ignore the resistance training, you know, the, the bill will come due, right? Isn't that what they say? <laughs> you know, if you don't eat protein, the bill will come due. And it might be when you're 60 or 70, you know, and your bone density is now weak because your muscle mass and you fall and you break your hip. Yeah, so you got to respect the laws of, of strength and maintaining muscle mass as well as, as mitochondrial function. And, you know, metabolomics is all this mitochondrial stuff. Now it's another whole field, you know, how the mitochondria function you know, or dysfunction and the effect on human health. Well, great, Mark. I, I'm really looking forward uh, to you taking a deeper dive into zone two training and and giving us uh, some more uh, stories about the uh, the technical aspects. And and you have a great way of really simplifying it in the end. So I'll, uh, I'll do my best <laughs> in a half hour, but I look forward to coming out. It's it'll be great to see so many uh, fun and interesting people like in the same room again. You know, I learned yeah. so much from that environment, you know, people asking just great questions. And, you know, if you're listening to this and haven't been to one of these conferences, you know, you, you, it's, it's great. Like, you, no matter what level you are, whether you're like a research scientist, they learn from talking to the real people doing this. And then the real people, you know, start to, they, they can pick up a lot of the science because I think everyone really makes the effort to, to bring it down to like our level, Jeff, like family docs, right? <laughs> they bring it to our level, which I think anyone any citizen who's done some reading on their own like this, most people have a pretty good understanding of the things we're talking about, you know, because of open access journals and podcasts now. So the, the education level of the average, you know, citizen scientist now, you know, is far superior, you know, I hate to say it, the many doctors, you know, where we'd learned something 30 years ago and that's, we haven't adapted at all. So I, I respect the citizen scientists out there as much as the people with the degrees. Yeah. Well, they learn that, from them every day, you know, my own patients, they did this and they had this response. And it's like, well, oh, let's look into that. That's cool. Well, you already asked uh, my, one of my last questions is uh, what you enjoy most about coming to these events. Yeah. The food's always good too. So like I'm looking forward to the food. Yeah. And going to Denver, I spent 10 years in Colorado. So it's never a bad thing to go back to Colorado. Yeah, but uh, as you just described, the connection with people is fantastic and and the learning, sharing the science. So uh, how can uh, people find out more about you, Mark? Yeah, I have a um, couple of places. I have a website, drmarksdesk.com. You can, if you want to contact me, I have a little running store here. So if you live anywhere near my area, so we're in Eastern West Virginia, it's Two Rivers Treads. Uh, we have a website, tworiverstreads.com. We do running clinics. We do running training, video analysis. So for people that are kind of geeky in the running space, come find us in our running store. It's a community store. We host races out of the store too, you know, community running events, which are like walking events too. A lot of people find entry in and go walk these trails. We're, we're in a national park setting here. So we're always doing trail runs and races. Great, Mark. And, and there's not altitude, so you can breathe better than doing, you know, the Trans Rockies or something. Well, I know when you come to Denver, you you hit you hit the trail, and uh, Breckenridge, the trails are wonderful. You have yeah, another town there, the passes. You like to get your high altitude training when you come out. Oh heck yeah! Well, good. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to February. Yeah, and for our audience, uh, if you want to hear more from Mark or our other speakers. Uh, please come to the conference in February, and for more information, you can visit lowcarbconferences.com. And until next time, and thanks again, Mark. No, thank you. See you all in February.